Good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's Soje Peel Lecture um, by Joan Cho from Wesleyan University. My name is Celeste Arrington, and I'm a member of the political science faculty at George Washington University and a part of the GW Institute for Korean Studies. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome you all from near and far to this lecture, our second lecture uh, in the Soje Peel Lecture Series this semester. Um, and it's especially my honor today to welcome Joan Cho, a good friend, to our GWIX lecture series. She is assistant professor at East Asian Studies and Government at Wesleyan and is finishing a book about um, authoritarianism in South Korea and its relationship to economic development and democratization, which is the topic of uh, today's talk. And let me just before turning it over to her for her presentation today, um, point out that you may enter um, questions for Professor Cho at any time during the talk in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I will be moderating the questions after her presentation today. Um, so with that, let me say, uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Cho for her presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Arrington, for your kind introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank the staff and faculty members at the GW Institute for Korean Studies, including Professor Chisu Kim for inviting me and for uh, and to Ms. Minna Kim for arranging everything for this talk to go smoothly. And thank you everyone for joining via Zoom. Um, it's nice to meet you everyone. And I'm delighted to um, share my research with you all today. Uh, my presentation today is based on my book manuscript, which is a work in progress, but also almost complete. Uh, today, I will first introduce you to the Korean case of democratization. I would then present parts of my book project that examines the effect of industrial policy on the development of labor movement during the authoritarian period in South Korea. And then lastly, I will situate the empirical findings from Korea in a broader context of theory building on the relationship between economic development and democracy. South Korea is a country that is often hailed as a success case of modernization theory, which essentially posits that economic development and modernization of a given country will eventually lead the country into democracy. And at first blush, as you can see from this graph, Korea seems to have taken a straight linear path from economic development to democracy. Uh, South Korea's GDP per capita was only around $67 in 1953, which was right after the Korean War. And this was comparable to the poorer countries in Africa and Asia at that time. South Korea's economy grew rapidly from the 60s through the 1980s under authoritarian rule with an average annual GDP growth rate of about 8.4%. And then in 1987, following mass nationwide protests, Korea became a democracy by reinstating direct presidential elections that were previously abolished by Park Geun-hye in 1972. So this narrative of South Korea's economic and political development isn't wrong, but to me, it is an oversimplification of how South Korea became a democracy following decades of authoritarian rule. And in the next few slides, I'm going to first make a case for why there needs to be a re-examination of the Korean case to deepen our understanding of the relationship between economic development and democracy. South Korean authoritarian regime is often classified as a military regime, given that both Park Jong-hee and Chen doo hwan were military generals and they seized political power through military coups. But it wasn't a pure military regime, as in legislative elections were held regularly throughout the authoritarian period. And this graph shows the changes in regime support throughout the period, and it is measured by the changes in the ruling party vote share. And as you can see from this graph, it's not the case that the ruling party vote share continued to decline as the country was developing economically over time. These graphs produced by the Stanford Korea Democracy Project display the number of pro-democracy protests 
and the number of uh, participants participating in these pro-democracy protests during the authoritarian period. The left graph shows the number of protests in the darker gray line. And it appears from this graph that there were more protests in the 70s and in the 80s. But then if you look at the figure on the right, there was a huge spike in the number of people participating in protests in 1987, but not a ton of variation before then. Again, um, all, all else held constant, if Korea indeed is an ideal case of a modernization theorist, we would have expected the number and intensity of protests to be increasing in a more linear manner. Lastly, another reason as to why it's necessary to re-examine the South Korean case more carefully is because of the subnational variations found within the case. In terms of economic development, major development projects were allocated to the autocrats' home region, and people from that region were also given influential government positions, including positions in the economic planning board that formulated and implemented economic policies. As for regime support, electoral data shows that rural areas were more supportive of the ruling party throughout the authoritarian period. As for pro-democracy protests, prior to the nationwide protests in 1987, these protests were more regionally contained or mainly happening in the capital city of Seoul. And as pointed out by political scientist Richard Snyder in his 2001 piece on the subnational comparative method, the tendency to focus on national level data and national unit of analysis contributes to a miscoding of a case that distort causal inferences and skew efforts at theory building. So through a more rigorous examination of the subnational and temporal variations found within the South Korean case, my book project uses the empirical findings from Korea to engage with the larger literature on economic development and democracy. So I am currently uh, working towards completing my book manuscript that is tentatively titled The Dictator's Modernity Dilemma, Development and Democracy in South Korea from 1961 to 1987. And my book project looks at how industrialization and education, including vocational education and higher education, impacted the political stability of the South Korean authoritarian regimes. Um, due, to the uh, due to time constraints, today's presentation will focus on the effects of industrialization on regime stability. And specifically, I'll be focusing on the development of industrial complexes that was very important to the authoritarian government's industrial policy. I will show that the development of industrial complexes initially had a stabilizing effect by allowing the dictators to buy political legitimacy and increase regime support with the economic benefits and the performances that were derived from these industrial complexes. I would then show that the policy also had a destabilizing effect in the long term by providing the social economic foundations for the gradual development of the labor movement, including the cross-class alliance that was formed between workers, students, and intellectuals. Uh, here, I would like to be clear that various groups were part of the pro-democracy movement in South Korea, including students, intellectuals, workers, religious groups, and opposition uh, politicians. And this movement also gained support from the middle class, as in the white collar workers in the late 1980s. Um, again, due to time constraints, this presentation will specifically focus on how the labor movement developed, which was part of the larger pro-democracy movement in South Korea. As mentioned earlier in the talk, Korea was extremely poor in the aftermath of the Korean War. When Park Jong-hee came into power in 1961, he made economic development his first priority. And as shown in the first quote on the screen, in a public speech Park made in 1962, he proclaimed how economics should precede politics or culture. And as the second quote shows, Park even stated that economic equity comes before political equity and undemocratic emergency measures may be necessary in improving living conditions. In line with his economy first or growth first ideology, 
Park's government implemented a series of five-year economic development plan to pursue export-led industrialization. The government officially adopted the export-oriented industrialization strategy in 1963, first starting with light manufacturing, including textiles, garments, wigs, and plywood. And as a result, exports grew by 40 times from $87 million in 1963 to $3.2 billion in 1973. And in 1973, Park launched his third five-year plan and announced an industrial upgrade plan to promote heavy and chemical industrialization. Heavy and chemical industries include iron and steel, machinery, auto manufacturing, shipbuilding, electronics, and petrochemicals. The heavy chemical industrial drive also led to the development of chebars, which are the large business conglomerates that are typically family owned, such as Hyundai, Samsung, and LG. And these chebars became ardent supporters of the dictatorship as they worked closely with the government to generate export-led economic growth. South Korea's successful export-led industrialization relied on the construction of massive industrial complexes. And this began in the early 1960s under Park Jong-hee, and it continued under his successor, Chun doo Um, Here, it is important for me to emphasize that while industrial development first began in Korea under Japanese colonial rule in the 30s and the 40s, no industrial complex or large scale industrial estates existed at that time. And then much of the physical infrastructures that were built by the Japanese were also destroyed during the Korean War. Uh, these industrial complexes were crux to the autocrats industrialization plan and they were built to maximize synergic effects among related industries and to enhance competition among firms in the same industry. So these industrial complexes were first built in inland cities in the 60s. And then with the heavy chemical industrial drive in the 70s, large scale industrial complexes were built in the coastal cities in the southeastern region of the country. And then finally, in the 80s, they were built in areas lacking industrial complexes to correct for the uneven patterns of regional development from the 60s and 70s. These industrial complexes were built with public resources, but private investments were also induced through various incentive measures. Businesses that set up factories in these industrial complexes were given powerful incentives to um, export. They received low bank loans, exemption from corporate income tax, as well as discounts on transportation and utility costs. To give you a sense of how these industrial complexes look like, here I have pictures of uh, two of the 67 industrial complexes that were developed throughout the authoritarian period. Uh, with regard to labor policies, as uh, Park's rule became increasingly authoritarian starting in the early 1970s, he proclaimed the uh, law concerning special measures for safeguarding national security that suspended workers' rights to bargain collectively and to engage in collective action. He also reconfigured the union structure from industrial union structure to an enterprise union system to maintain control on local unions and contain union activities within each enterprise. And in fact, many of these official enterprise unions were company controlled unions. Therefore, the labor movement that began to emerge in the 1970s was a movement to transfer Form these existing company controlled unions into more of a genuinely representative uh, unions or to create an independent union, which often wasn't recognized by the state and deemed illegal. And they often got disbanded by the company or by the state security forces. When there were any attempts by workers to express their grievances in a more organized fashion during this time, they were intimidated, fired, or blacklisted by the company and the state security forces. So with this contextual information in mind, um, now I'm going to turn to the impacts of industrial complexes on regime stability. 
In the short term, the economic growth and benefits that were generated through the construction of industrial complexes allowed the authoritarian governments to diffuse political discontent and buy political legitimacy. Specifically, the construction of industrial complexes provided targeted economic benefits to the residents uh, living in areas surrounded by um, these industrial complexes. And some of these um, benefits include increasing local employment, uh, enhancing local economy, investments that are brought in, such as um, infrastructure, as well as um, welfare benefits that were provided to those living in, uh, to those who were uh, working in these industrial complexes. A 2015 study on Korea's industrial policy shows that the constituents who were living near an industrial complex became more supportive of the ruling party after the allocation of the industrial complex in their area. The authors find that the uh, Park's Democratic Republican Party gained 12 to 14 percent more votes in areas that were chosen as sites for industrial complexes. But interestingly, the authors also find that the political effect of industrial complexes on regime support were smaller and weaker in the long term. So they find that there's an increase in support in the election immediately after the announcement of the appointment of the industrial complex in the particular um, area, but they do not find um, the same level of um, um, support once the industrial complex is beginning to be built or completed from um, the construction. They also find that the size of the positive effect is larger on the park um, compared to um, Chun Duan's time period, which is um, following park's time. With regard to the workers, initially they also became loyal to the state by embracing their state propagated identity as industrial warrior citizens. Uh, factory workers were called industrial warriors, builders of industry and leading force of exports. So um, the label industrial warriors represented the state's attempt to define the identity of factory workers as soldiers who are involved in an economic warfare against foreign competitors who are willing to sacrifice themselves for the glory and the betterment of the nation. An example of the state rhetoric is found in Park jung hees Labor Day speech that was delivered in 1966. And he spoke about the working class Koreans in these flattering terms. Um, each and every one of the Korean workers who are working busily in factories and mines or on the railroad or harbor or in other workplaces across Korea is the true pillar and warrior in our effort for the modernization of our homeland. Throughout 60s and 70s, majority of the factory workers, especially in light manufacturing, were women and they were traditionally looked down upon by society at large. Um, there was even this derogatory term kongsuni, which meant little miss factory. And these women workers began to embrace the state propagated identity um, found in um, Park's speech and in state rhetoric. Uh, even at places like Tongyeo Textile, which was infamous for its labor activism at a time when labor activism wasn't prevalent in the country, some of the workers at Tongyeo Textile started to call themselves pillars of industry, the exact term that Park used. Yi Jae-son, a female worker at Tongyeo Textile, wrote, I've worked for Tongyeo Bangjik for two years now, still a young girl when I first entered this place. Now I am a grown woman and I became a pillar of industry who pours all my care into cloth weaving. So by embracing the state propagated identity as industrial warriors, workers internalized the state's goals as their personal goals, showing how factory workers themselves also identified with the regime's values, thereby further legitim legitimating the economy first policy that the government pursued. So, so far I've discussed the short term effects of the industrial policy and how it helped stabilize the authoritarian regime. 
Now I will turn to investigating the long-term effect on labor movement that ultimately destabilized the regime. As these figures on number of disputes and number of unions show, labor was weak in the early phases of industrialization. Um, and starting in 1970s and during the early to mid 1980s, workers began to organize, but strikes and protests that were happening around this time were mostly spontaneous as in not well organized, and they were contained in a single company. And oftentimes the issues that were raised in these strikes and protests were limited to economic issues only. And the gradual development of workers' capacity to organize against their employers, as well as against the state, was manifested during the great worker struggle in 1987, the year in which Korea democratized and also marked by the red vertical dotted line in um, these graphs. The great worker struggle was the largest and the first nationwide labor movement since industrialization approximately 1.2 million workers from most major industries participated in this massive nationwide industrial protest. What was significant about the great worker struggle was that the demands raised were not limited to economic ones, but also addressed democratization of workplace. Korean historian Kyung Moon Hwang states that the laborers who had so long sacrificed for their employers would not have made the breakthrough toward gaining fair treatment and recognition of their economic rights. Without the great labor uprising, the democratization of 1987 would have been incomplete, perhaps even meaningless. So in other words, the great worker struggle provided the final impetus for full democratization in South Korea. To empirically examine the impact of industrial complexes on labor protests, I created an events data set on the great worker struggle using archival materials from the Korea Democracy Foundation in, um, in Korea. This figure shows the regional variation in labor protests during the great worker struggle. The darker regions are the counties that experienced more labor protests in 1987. And not surprisingly, as this figure shows, a lot of these protests occurred in the very areas that the autocrats built industrial complexes, indicated by the red dots. In explaining the gradual development of the Korean labor movement, I hypothesized that the authoritarian government's industrial policy, specifically the development of industrial complexes, generated a centralized pattern of industrialization which facilitated the organization and politicization of workers. So to test this hypothesis, I empirically examined two things. So first, I examined whether the industrial complexes had a direct impact on the labor protests in 1987. And second, I also examined whether the spatial concentration of factories resulting from the development of industrial complexes mediated the effect that the industrial complexes had on the labor protests. My unit of analysis is county, which is one administrative unit below province, um, Xi Gungbu in um, Korea. And my outcome variable is the number of great worker struggle protests in a given county. My treatment variable is industrial complex, and I measure it in two different ways. Um, the first is the presence of industrial complex. So whether the county received the treatment, which is industrial complex or not. So whether a, a, a county um, got an industrial complex or not, at least one industrial complex. And second is the duration of industrial complex. Mm -hmm. So this measures how long this county had at least one industrial complex by 1987. And this measure helps us to capture the intensity of the treatment or the, or the temporal dimension of uh, the treatment that each county received. The mediator or the causal mechanism that I propose uh, 
and examine is the concentration of factories in each county, which is measured by the number of manufacturing firms in each county. So I use this measure because there are counties that have manufacturing firms, even if they didn't have industrial complexes. But we would expect that having an industrial complex would impact the total number of factories in a given county. Also, this is the most comprehensive measure that I was able to find at the county level. And there are various pretreatment and post-treatment covariates that I include in my analysis, and they are listed um, on the slide. To investigate the effect of industrial complexes on the great worker struggle protest that is mediated by the spatial concentration of factories and factory workers, I estimate the controlled direct effect of industrial complex using the sequential G estimator. The average control direct effect represents the causal effect of a treatment when the mediator is fixed at a particular level for all of the units. So in my case, I set the value of the number of manufacturing firms to the mean value of the number of manufacturing firms for all of the counties. Estimating the control direct effect allows me to examine whether there is a direct effect of the treatment that is not entirely driven by the causal mechanism. And that will allow me to say that the government's construction of the industrial complex indeed had a causal effect on the protests. Estimating the control direct effect also allows me to find out how much of the treatment effect is driven indirectly by the mediator. And I can um, look into that by comparing the average treatment effect, which is also the total effect, and the average controlled direct effect. This table presents the results from the analysis. Columns one and three report the total effects, which is also called the average treatment effects of the industrial complexes on labor protests. Columns two and four are reporting the controlled direct effect of the industrial complex, which um, is calculated by setting the number of manufacturing firms at the mean values for all of the units. So what you see in this table is that the estimated average controlled direct effects in columns two and four are both statistically significant and positive, suggesting that there is there exists a strong direct effect of industrial complex on labor protests that is not completely driven by the mediator. So this ensures that there was an effect, um, a causal effect of the industrial policy on the great worker struggle protests. Um, holding everything else at constant, there are approximately eight more protests during the Great Workers Struggle in counties that had industrial complex versus not. Holding everything else at constant, a five-year increase in the duration of industrial complex is associated with increasing three more protests during the Great Workers Struggle. So the results suggest that in, uh, industrial complexes increased labor activism and counties that had an industrial complex or at least one industrial complex for a longer period of time also had more protests. In assessing the strength of the causal mechanism, assuming that there's no interaction between the treatment and the mediator at the individual level, the estimated average control direct effects in columns two and four are smaller than the average treatment effects in columns one and three. So this suggests that the causal mechanism did play an important role. And in fact, fixing the mediator eliminates about 36% of the total effect of the industrial complex on labor protests. So how did these industrial complexes facilitate labor mobilization in the long term? First, the ecology of industrial complexes facilitated labor mobilization among workers within and across firms. According to sociologist Ding Xin Zhao, ecological conditions defined as the spatial characteristics of a physical environment and the accompanying density, distribution, composition, place-based relations, and routine special activities of a given popul 
population could function as a social structure and achieve predominance in the mobilization. Uh, Zhao's research on the 1989 Beijing student movement demonstrated that the ecological conditions of college campuses in Beijing facilitated the student movement in 1989. And I apply this concept to the Korean case to show how the ecological conditions of the industrial complexes played a role in labor mobilization within and across different factories. And in doing so, I provide examples and evidence found in the secondary literature, both in Korean and English, and primary sources from the Korea Democracy Foundation, including its oral archive. So Korean factory workers um, not only work together inside the factories, but they also live together in factory dorms inside the industrial complexes or in tiny rooming houses in areas surrounding the industrial complexes. On the bottom left of the slide, we see a picture of the beehive houses that were built near the Kuro industrial complex in Seoul. Typically, three to four people will pool their money to share one room. Uh, two of them usually had the day shift and the other two usually had night shifts and that's how they were able to um, share one room. And as the picture on the uh, bottom right shows, these beehive houses were very, very similar to the factory dorms in terms of the physical structure, as well as the room sharing and bathroom sharing arrangements. Factory dorms and rooming houses inside and outside the industrial complexes provided the foundation for workers to organize the independent unions that I uh, mentioned in uh, a couple of slides ago. For example, at Wampung Textile, workers used the physical structure of their dormitories as a template for an organizational structure for their independent labor union. Small groups uh, inside factories and factory dorms and these rooming houses helped foster solidarity and recruit union members. And workers learned about labor rights and how to organize unions through study groups and night schools that were happening in these rooming houses um, attended by workers from different firms. And in the 1980s, labor struggles were characterized by inter-union solidarity strikes in which workers from different companies participated in a joint solidarity strike. So this new tactic is in contrast to the tactics of the 1970s when labor struggles were uh, confined to a single firm. This tactic of inter-firm solidarity struggle was first introduced through the 1985 Kuro Industrial Complex Solidarity Strike. And it was also seen during the 1987 Great Workers' Struggle. Um, in today's presentation, I will use the Kuro Industrial Complex Solidarity Strike to show how the ecology of the industrial complex contributed to the development of this new tactic of inter-firm solidarity struggles. But we also saw um, the similar kind of um, dynamic in the great workers' struggle as well. The 1985 Kuro Solidarity Strike began on June 24th, 1985, two days after the union leaders of Teu Apparel were arrested. Uh, some of the demands that were raised during this solidarity strike included um, demanding the release of the arrested union leaders, um, demanding uh, revision of the labor laws, um, guarantee of workers three basic rights, as well as calling for the resignation of the Minister of Labor at that time. The initial coordination of this inter-solidarity strike on June 24th was possible due to the inter-firm union activities that were already happening among Kuro industrial complex workers. And these inter-firm union activities were made possible due to the close proximity of the factories inside the industrial complex and through the small groups that were meeting in the rooming houses that were attended by workers from different factories inside the Kuro industrial complex. And during the solidarity strike, we also saw 
ecology dependent protest tactics that were used by workers to demonstrate their solidarity with workers from other firms. On June 24th, Teu apparel workers put up banners and placards on the second floor window of their factory building, listing the demands that they're raising during the strike. And on that same day, they heard the sound of gongs from the opposite building where Hyosung Products was located. Um, and you can see this in the map on the slide. Um, the sound of gong was a signal that the Hyosung workers had started their strike. Hyosung workers put up a big placard stating Teu fighting. Uh, fighting doesn't sound very encouraging in English, but it is a commonly used word for encouragement in Korea. Um, so in response, Teu workers also posted a sign on their window that read, stay strong Hyosung, which is what the bottom left picture on the slide is showing, although um, the words might be a little small. And as you can see from the timeline that I have on the right side of the screen, from June 25th to the 28th, workers from other firms either organized protests in solidarity or they directly joined the joint solidarity strike that was happening since the 24th, but later in time. These firms who joined um, the strike or organized protests in solidarity also used ecology dependent mobilization strategies um, and they did that they, and they did this by posting placards on their buildings as well as chanting and sing, singing songs outside in their factory communal grounds so that the workers from other firms will see their signs and also hear their chants and songs uh, it is open it is important to note that no direct line of communication existed among these firms. Um, the activists shared in their interview that they weren't even able to communicate using a landline phone at this time. And while the three firms that protest in solidarity on June 25th and 26th had previously participated in the interunion activities with the other four firms that initiated the strike on the 24th, Samsung pharmaceutical workers didn't have such history, yet by being in the same industrial complex and being exposed to what was going on, they protested in solidarity on the 27th and the 28th. As for Pulung um, they joined the joint solidarity strike on the 28th, four days after, uh, three days after the strike initially began. And one of the labor activists shared in this interview that he purposely took the union officers to see the protests that were happening in action inside the industrial complex, and that influenced the union leader's decision to eventually join the solidarity strike. So what we're seeing here is that the ecology of industrial complex not only facilitated the initial coordination of the interfirm solidarity strike, but it also played a significant role in the spread and development of the subsequent strikes and protests, especially when no direct line of communication existed among these firms. It was the high density and close proximity of the factories and the factory workers inside the industrial complexes that made it possible for gongs and chants to be audible, for signs to be visible, and for workers to witness the protests of their peers at other firms. Uh, lastly, the ecology of industrial complexes not only facilitated mobilization of workers within and across firms, but it also facilitated the entry of social activists into the labor movement. The study groups and the small groups that I mentioned earlier were actually jump-started by these Christian and student activists. In the 60s and 70s, Christian activists set up churches and social welfare organizations nearby industrial complexes. Um, few dedicated Christian ac activists even lived and worked as factory workers. Um, and then in the 1980s, college students dropped out of school to become factory workers or student turned workers. 
And this happened soon after um, college students were radicalized following the 1980 Gwangju massacre that happened soon after Chun Doohan came into power th through a military coup. Um, as a result of um, experiencing the massacre and uh, having and the movement having become radicalized, students became more interested in Minjung issues, um, people's issues, including labor issues. What also happened during the 80s was that Chun Doohan revised the Trade Union Act to prohibit third party intervention in labor disputes. So this resulted in students deciding to become workers themselves to directly participate in the labor movement. And I have found primary documents from the Korea Democracy Foundation archives showing how these Christian student activists were aware of the government's development plans regarding the industrial complexes and how they deliberately considered the ecological conditions of these industrial complexes in strategizing and entering these um, uh, factories. So how can we make sense of the time bearing effects of the industrial policy on regime stability? In other words, how can we make sense of the fact that the industrial complexes stabilize the regime in the short term, but also destabilize the regime in the long term? So this graph shows the concentration of workers in different regions measured by the number of fa uh, factory workers per factory in these different regions of regions of Korea over time. And the graph shows that um, over time, the concentration of workers is increasing, demonstrated by the height of the bars. And as I discussed in my previous slides, the spatial concentration of factories and the ecological conditions of the industrial complexes provided the mobilizing structures for the gradual development of the labor movement. Second, what we're seeing in this graph is that the concentration of workers was initially um, higher in the Seoul, um, Gyeonggi, Incheon areas. And this is where most of the labor activ activism was observed in the 1970s. Um, and the Seoul, Gyeonggi, Incheon region is in the darkest blue. And then we see that the concentration of workers in the Busan, Daegu, Gyeongsang region increases significantly between 1971 and 1981. Uh, and this is shaded in the lightest blue. And this change is uh, corresponds to the number of industrial complexes that were built in this particular region during the heavy chemical industrial drive that began in 1973. And by mid 1980s, we see that the concentration of workers is more even across the country, which helps us to explain how the 1987 great worker struggle protests were nationwide, not just happening in the typical um, areas, which, were, which typically was um, Seoul and the areas surrounding Seoul, such as Gyeonggi and Incheon. As pointed out by political scientist Paul Pearson in his book, Politics and Time, societal changes resulting from policies are often gradual, slow moving and cumulative. The changes may not appear immediately and initially have modest or negligible impact. And as I've shown in my presentation in the Korean case, the development induced societal changes, such as the expansion of working class, especially the increasing spatial concentration of workers on the national scale, happened gradually over time. Therefore, the destabilizing effect of the industrial policy pertaining to the industrial complexes lagged behind the time in which the autocrats industrial policies were implemented. And this empirical finding from Korea allows me to theorize that the time varying effect of industrialization on authoritarian regime durability could be explained by the timing and pace in which development induced large scale nationwide social changes occur within a given country. Um, to summarize what I've shown you today in the presentation is that the relationship between industrialization and democratization in Korea was not as linear as modernization theory depicts it to be. The industrial policy, specifically um, the development of industrial complexes, had an initial stabilizing effect on authoritarian rule, 
by increasing regime support. But it also provided the social economic foundations for the emergence of a successful labor movement that destabilized the regime. And the time varying effect of the policy is explained by the timing and pace in which development induced societal changes occur in a given country. In Korea, it was the central pattern of industrialization created by the authoritarian governments that facilitated the organization and politicization of the workers that ultimately contributed to the destabilization of the regime in the long term. And this finding suggests that it is not just the increasing level of economic development that modernization theory emphasizes, but also patterns of economic development that may impact democratization as well. Furthermore, the implication of this particular finding is that patterns of industrialization under authoritarianism may impact whether democratization results from below or from above. So for example, Taiwan industrialized and democratized around the same time as South Korea in the 1980s, but Taiwan ex exhibited a dispersed pattern of industrialization um, in contrast to the centralized pattern of industrialization that we saw in Korea. And in Taiwan, labor protests and other mass protests didn't play a major role in Taiwan's um, democratization, while massive nationwide protests, including labor protests, occurred in South Korea. So this is a way in which we might think about how patterns of industrialization matters, and it also helps us to think about um, the process in which democratization would occur. So I'll end my presentation here. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and I really look forward to your questions and further discussions during the Q&A. Great, thank you very much, Joan, for this fascinating presentation. I think we get a really excellent sense of the regional variation and the temporal variation in um, economic development as well as citizens' responses to um, state repression. So I wanna um, just pick up at the end of your talk, you briefly compared Korea's pattern of industrialization, in particular, the concentrated industrial complexes in Korea with Taiwan's more dispersed industrial pat industrialization pattern. If you look more broadly, how does um, Korea's industrial complexes, how do they compare with other countries industrial complexes. Was this something relatively unusual in late developing countries? Uh, to what extent does this uh, form of industrialization exist elsewhere? So thank you for, um, for uh, the summary of my talk and for this question. Um, to answer your question about the industrial complexes in Korea versus other late developing countries, um, so I think um, so I think I will have to first um, discuss about the variation of industrial complex found even within Korea. Um, so as I've mentioned, the industrial complexes that were in the south eastern coast were larger um, in scale, even compared to the other industrial complex in the inland cities. And um, and it also maps on to the different uh, industrial sectors. So the southeastern coastal ones that were bigger were also focusing on heavy chemical industry that required uh, more skilled workers. And it also overlapped with um, um, hiring more male workers who were uh, specializing in um, um, engineering and so forth. Um, so even within Korea, there is this variation. And if we were to compare Korea to other um, developing countries, I think it's, um, we see that industrial complexes exist in other places as well, um, but we will probably I see um, some countries have the similar kind of the industrial complex that exists in the inland parts of Korea, while um, there are going to be some other countries that had the more of the massive scale um, industrial complexes as well. Um, but I think, you know, your question about, you know, um, how can we 
generalize the findings from Korea to think about the role of industrial complexes in other developing countries. I think um, the, the, the most obvious uh, country that people can think about and would ask me about is China. Um, because we know that there are these uh, special economic zones in China as well. And there actually has been some increase in the level of uh, labor activism there as well. Um, so people might wonder, oh, so, you know, are we going to see something similar in China that the workers are going to mobilize in the way in which Korean workers did? Is that going to bring about um, democracy? And one thing that I've noticed, at least for now, is that the protests that we saw in Korea that led, that happened during the transition period and um, uh, contributed to the, to the consolidation of democracy, these protests were not or at least towards the end, they were not just focusing on economic issues. They were not just protesting against their employers, but they were actually targeting the state for the state to change the law, the state to you know replace the minister. And we don't really see that in China right now. Um, there are uh, protests that are about wage and other economic issues, but we don't really see these protests uh, directly criticizing the CCP or asking for um, you know the regime change um, so I think that um, these industrial complexes even in China um, they can serve as a mechanism to uh, facilitate labor mobilization and I do think that their um, capacity to organize is going is increasing will increase as a result of these industrial complexes and the workers living together they also have factory dorms as well but what when and whether the mobilization will intensify and become politicized would i think would be explained by the authoritarian government's repressive and distrib distributive policies um, so um, when we think about china <laughs> i don't want to talk too much about china but um, there are um, some repressive and distributed policies that are unique to China that's different from Korea, such as uh, the downway work unit system, the hukou system of household registration that really enmeshes the citizens um, uh, dependence on the state and their um, basic benefits, including their work could be taken away if they um, prove politically unreliable. So because of these um, distributed policies that are coercive, according to um, um, Albertus, Benner, and Slater, uh, that these distributed policies that are already in place that um, make it harder for workers to actually go against the state um, in the way that um, the Korean workers um, have done in the past. Um, so uh, I'll stop here and answer more questions. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, we had a follow-up question, I think, from Merose Huang in the Q&A. And um, she was asking, did the concentration of these complexes also make it harder to suppress the protests? And I might add there, um, did the firms, the bosses, uh, did they find it easier to learn from each other in terms of how to repress labor activism because they were closely located together? So the question was asking whether, was it the concentration of the firms that made it harder for the companies and the state security forces harder to repress? Um, yes, so, um, so just empirically, when we compare the 70s and 80s, I've already mentioned in my presentation that in the 70s, a lot of the uh, labor disputes were happening just within one firm. And um, a lot of these were um, directly responded by the company or the state um, as soon as these disputes happened. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why um, scholars of uh, workers and labor movement have pointed out as a weakness of the labor movement at that time. And um, what made 80s different was the fact that now workers are protesting with each other. 
which is already showing that they have overcome this limitation of um, not being able to make the issue beyond their just own firm issue. But this is an issue that is happening uh, among all workers, not just us in this one particular firm. And uh, as the um, um, the person who was asking the question, uh, what I was trying to show in this presentation was that it is this concentration of workers living together and working together um, that actually allowed them to overcome this um, obstacle that they had before and to be able to organize more effectively, which actually increases the cost of repression um, um, on behalf of the employers and the state. Um, because um, when we look at how governments engage, authoritarian governments engage in repression more broadly, there is this balance that they need to make. Um, if the if the, the um, if the protest or the event is like small and isolated, it's easy to identify and just like squash it. But if it's um, if it gets bigger and it gains attention from different people, especially the general public, um, it is harder to just repress them because that might actually um, lead more people to be upset, more workers to join, as well as ordinary citizens to also join the protest. Um, so I would say that uh, if it's bigger, it might be more easier to identify and you can just like get all of them and jail them, but because of the salience of that event itself, it actually increases the cost of repression. Great, thank you very much. I think somewhat building on your comparison between the 70s and the 80s, Ambassador Kathy Stevens has asked um, you to relate the um, 1979 Pusan Masan uh, workers strikes to the industrial complexes and to the great, um, the work, the great labor struggle that you're talking about. And I, I think if I understand her, the direction of her question correctly, um, one thing is to what extent could you imagine the great labor, labor struggle happening in the mobilizing structures that you're describing in industrial complexes working so well if there hadn't been this prior wave of labor activism in 79? Mm. Yes, yeah, so I think that might be right, but go ahead. Yeah, so I, hopefully I also understood the question um, correctly, and please correct me if, if there's any misunderstanding. Uh, but it is uh, right that the the this is the YH incident in 1979 that um, Ambassador Stevens is referring to. Um, so this was um, um, so this incident. Uh, was so female workers from the YH company and YH company was actually not inside an industrial complex to my understanding. Uh, and this is still in the seventies when we didn't see the inter-firm solidarity strike uh, tactic that I um, introduced in the presentation. Um, and the significance of this incident was that the workers ended up protesting at the opposition party's headquarter and that's how this labor protest was politicized. And um, the, because it happened at the opposition party's headquarter, the government arrested the leader, Kim yong sam And people who are living in his constituency, uh, Busan, and then the neighboring uh, town, Masan, protested against what happened to uh, Kim yong sam So, this incident was very significant in a way that it was like one of the first incidences in which we um, see a direct connection between labor issues that don't just remain as labor issues, but they become politicized and it actually instigates more protest. Um, so in that way, this was actually a significant event that uh, is part of the larger arc of um, labor movement and the development of labor movement. Um, and Masan is also, um, Busan and Masan um, is the area in which we saw a lot of protests later during the great worker struggle as well. So it is uh, a little bit more difficult to discuss the direct uh, connection 
between 1979 and the great worker struggle, but we do see that it did lay this foundation uh, and it is showing how the, the labor movement was developing gradually over time. So even in the 70s, when we say that the protest was just in this one company, in this one location, but we see how um, it was part of this like um, gradually developing process. And I guess one thing that I might want to add is that the 1979 um, protest was aided by Christian activists. Um, but as a result of that, the Christian organization be, uh, became more repressed and then they slowly diminished in their, um, the role of the Christian activists slowly diminished before the students came in. Um, but we see that the emergence of 1979 was also a product of um, the alliance with Christians. And this is all part of the story that I'm trying to tell about the development of labor movement in relation to the repressive policies. Great, thank you. Um, I think this question relates to your point about the, the link between labor politics and broader politics generally. But Professor Yong Chul Ha has asked a couple of questions about um, your underlying assumption about whether uh, workers were developing a sense of, of class consciousness in Korea, um, whether you think they were or not. And then related to that, uh, whether their demands, um, I guess, were more proximate in terms of workers' rights or had broader implications um, maybe if there's change across time and the nature of their demands where they became more um, sort of democratic in their demands in terms of making demands on for regime change um, or liberalized political liberalization. Um, and then the third piece of this question uh, asks you to explain a little bit more, and I think you were just getting at it when your shift from workers plus Christians to workers plus students is how would you describe the relationship between workers and students, especially in the 1980s? Okay, uh, thank you for uh, these questions. And actually, I think I would have to give credit to other scholars who have already um, written a lot about um, this topic um, with regard to the development of workers' consciousness. Um, I would have to um, cite um, Professor Hagen Koo's uh, work on Korean workers and his book is a wonderful source to um, get a, you know, a good understanding of how workers' consciousness was developed uh, over time. And he also talks about the role that um, Christians and students played in this process. And um, it is actually, so, you know, it, it is true that, you know, it, we can't just take it as a given. Um, the workers' consciousness has to be developed and this was done through the small groups that um, I talked about and the night schools and the study groups that were happening where the workers actually learned about the rights that they had. Um, and beyond that, once they you know, realized that, oh, we have rights and oh, the struggles that I having is actually something that could be fixed. And this is something that other people are having as well. Then they actually also have to learn how to organize unions. You know, like what is the law? You need at least 30 people to actually register. You go to the Ministry of Labor. These things were also um, taught by the Christians and um, student activists. And also um, some, there are also labor activists who were laborers as well, who were playing more of a leadership role. So it's not the case that the workers were completely just passive and receiving these education. They were also playing an active role as well, but it is true that they received help from these other groups. And as a result, um, the nature of their demand changed. Uh, I, think, I think this is reflective of how um, the, the democracy movement was radicalized in the 80s. And um, students were playing a big role and um, some students became extremely radical by even, you know, um, entertaining like Chu Che and Kim Il-sungism. And um, so in general, there is this like very leftist kind of turn to the movement. And there is this like emphasis of like 
the role of workers in organizing the revolution. So there is definitely this um, impact as well. And then in order to talk about the relationship between workers and students, again, I will probably have to uh, um, mention um, Professor Nam Hee Lee's work on the uh, making of the Minjung, and she actually provides a very interesting account of how um, there was this like bifurcation between workers and students. So it's easy for us to think about how, you know, oh, the students were you know, genuinely very interested and passionate and they really wanted to advance labor issues. And that was true. But she also finds that there was this like um, sense of like moral obligation and some sort of like superiority um, that students also had um, in their interaction with workers as well. So I think it's a little bit more complex than how I you know, had to present in the presentation. At the risk of complexifying it even more, um, I wanna broaden our scope so far, we've been discussing primarily domestic factors in Korea. Um, and Michael Kerr raised the question of what uh, impact did US um, capital have on the industrializing product project? Um, you might add also Japanese foreign direct investment here um, and the broader US ROK alliance system. Um, so how would you bring these into your um, argument, these factors, especially the, um, the role of the US as an ally for South Korea? Uh, this is a great question. And um, I think I might need some time just to collect my thought because US alliance U.S. RK relations date back to like the 19, well, date way back, but if we were to begin with the occupation and then um, what role they were playing in providing support for the development and then what role were they playing in, um, so, uh, playing in their role in allowing the dictatorship to exist. So there's different layers to this. And um, it is true that Korea's relationship with the United States was, um, I mean, people often characterize it as a patron-client relations, as in it was uneven. Korea was very reliant on the United States for economic aid and also for national security. Uh, as you would know that, you know, um, Korea still hosts military, U.S. military troops uh, for um, national security. But over time, um, the relationship has become less uneven. Um, so therefore, you know, um, we can think about U.S.'s influence um, um, changing as a result of Korea's increase in economic power. Um, but it is true that um, South Korea was able to develop economically through um, aid given by the United States. Syngman Rhee's regime was very reliant on the United States. Um, Park Jong-hee, um, he uh, was very, in the 70s, he was very, well, 60s as well, but he was very concerned about um, US troops possibly um, leaving or re being reduced. Um, this was around the Vietnam War. Uh, and in fact, he decided to even send Korean troops um, to participate in the Vietnam War. And as a result of that, Korea did receive financial support from the United States and also reassurance from the United States that um, the US would not reduce um, troops uh, in South Korea. And around the same time, Park jong hee also normalized relations with Japan. Um, he received a lot of um, grants and economic aid from Japan. Um, it was supposed to be used for reparation of the war victims, but we do know that uh, for fact now through the Truth and Reconciliation Committee's findings that the money that was received from Japan through the normalization was actually used a lot for economic development plans. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure projects that I mentioned way beginning the um, presentation, those monies also came from um, that process. Um, so economically, I think we can think of uh, how US has contributed to economic development of Korea during that time and how that in, how that in turn would have helped stabilizing the regime. Uh, we can also think about um, 
the USS role in terms of, um, you know, allowing a military, uh, uh, allowing dictatorships to exist, but a, a dictatorship that is anti-communist to exist in um, South Korea. Um, so I mentioned the 1980 Gwangju massacre that radicalized the students. Um, so that's also when anti-Americanism um, was, uh, I guess, sort of born in Korea because the students at that time were critical that how is it that the US government who actually has power over how troops in Korea is moved did not really do anything to prevent the massacre from happening. Um, so, so there is that, and then, um, and then in 1987, when the Korean government decided to concede democracy in response to the nationwide protests, including the Great Workers' Struggle. Um, well, this was actually right before the Great Workers' Struggle, but um, it is known that you know President Chan received a letter from the US president saying that, oh, you shouldn't do what you did um, in 1980 Gwangju. Um, you shouldn't respond with repression. Um, so that, you know, I guess, shaped the way in which the government uh, responded to the protests and how democratization resulted. So I guess I'm saying something similar to earlier that, you know, when we think about us RK relations, the effect that US had on Korea, you know, there's different dimensions to that. So it's hard to just talk about it in aggregate. So hopefully it was helpful that I sort of broken it down to like the development aspect and uh, um, the decision regarding democratization aspect separately. Yeah, thank you. I think that's really helpful. Um, you summarized it much better than I could have. Thank you for that. And I think you also addressed, I was gonna ask Linda Yar's question about um, how ROK participation in the Vietnam War uh, fits into the nexus between economic development and democratization. So I think that was maybe, you know, U U.S. investment um, and as well as fears by the ROK government that the U.S. was going to abandon Korea there. So thank you for that. Um, I want to turn back uh, domestically and Don Kirk has asked a question about um, the, the government authorized uh, Federation of Korean Trade Unions and the then illegal um, Korean Confederation of Trade Unions, which were increasingly active during this period. And I think he's in part asking you um, to speak about how you get from inter-firm union cooperation to these large federations. And then over time, uh, how do they evolve into the into the active political entities that we see today in workers' um, activism in South Korea? Thank you for this question. Um, so the question was about um, how the KCTU was formed as a result of the great workers' struggle. Um, so, so I think that's, um, hopefully I understood the question um, correctly. So, um, to my understanding, KCTU um, uh, was not officially recognized until mid 1990s or so, mid to late 1990s. And, but we can say that um, the organizational form or the structure of the entity did exist prior to um, KCTU becoming official. And, I, I do see that there is a connection to the great worker struggle because um, after the great worker struggle, what we start to see is that there were more region based um, or like regional chapters of um, trade unions being formed. Again, these are still you know not legal, but they uh, would form and the leaders of uh, these regional chapters were um, labor activists who have experiences from the great worker struggles. But then we can go back further in time um, by identifying the people who were part of the democratic, uh, uh, the democratic, the independent democratic union movement who also uh, 
became active in the great worker struggle, and then they go on to form these like regional level um, trade organization that is not official and not legal, but then they have these different chapters and collectively they are to form the um, KCTU later on. And I actually see a very similar pattern um, of this process and structure uh, in the student movement as well in Korea that um, the the I'm, I'm forgetting on the exact English title of the organization but um, the Chondeha which is the National College Student Association that actually was formed right after the June Democratic Uprising which is the other nationwide protests that happened right before the Great Worker Struggle and that organization was also formed after as a result of students participating in the great uh, in the June Democratic Uprising. So, um, so I saw I see something similar that there is this like gradual development of the movement that happens, but I think the nationwide protests such as the June Democratic Uprising and the Great Worker Struggles play a role in sort of like um, solidifying the, the the gradual development and leading into a formation of this like more nationwide coordinated organized um, organization, including the KCT. Thank you. Um, I have two sort of more pr specific questions in the Q&A. And the first is from Jonathan Carella. And he's asking uh, why there, it seems that in Kangwon province, that there is a um, higher concentration of internet uh, industrial complexes. Was there something specific to Kangwon province? I think he's referring to one of um, your slide about the geographic concentration. Um, so I think um, I think he might be referring to Kyunggi. the slide that I had about explain the time, time varying effects of industrial policy. And okay. I know we're not sharing the screen right now, but when I'm looking at the graph, um, Kangwon actually does not have a high concentration of uh, workers compared to other regions. Um, the region that has the most initially is the Seoul, Gyeonggi, Incheon, and then it switches over to um, a lot more in Busan, Daegu, and Gyeongsang. Um, and then we see the Chungcheong region, um, that's the inland area. Um, so, um, so it might have been like, um, and the color is not being very easy for okay. the audience to um, differentiate. So uh, I apologize for that if it was confusing. No worries. There's another specific question about from Michael Goodman about were there any industrial complexes on Jeju Island? Uh, not to my understanding, um, but there are other kinds of, um, so there were agricultural industrial complexes as well that I do not really um, examine and include in my study, but in terms of the industrial complexes, um, um, not on Jeju Island to my, to, from my understanding. Okay, and Jonathan is clarified. He said relative to population in Kangwon province. Oh, there's a tiny yes. general population. Thank you, um, Jonathan. Yes, so um, it is true that Kangwon region is known for mining and there were a lot of uh, uh, workers in mining. So I think that helps us to uh, understand that there's more concentration of workers given how the population is not as high in that region. So that's a good point. Okay, thanks. And then another specific question from Ron B. Um, he's asking, first, thanks you for your insightful talk. And also asks with regard to the Kuro um, complex, industrial complex strike, what was the ratio of female to male workers? Um, and did the gender balance in the industrial complexes more generally influence the formation of what you've called mobilizing structures? So I don't have the exact, oh, uh, I actually might have the, the, the government document uh, with the numbers, but I would have to check the exact numbers. But uh, 
based on my memory of um, reading about the industrial complex and the, the solidarity strike, um, there it's, it, it does appear to be the case that they were more women workers because um, the Kuro industrial complex was um, mostly light manufacturing. And we do see this like um, this overlap with um, gen so light manufacturing, we see more women workers and heavy chemical industry, we see more male workers. Um, so there were more women workers, but when we look at the the union leaders that were arrested um, at Teu, um, it included both um, well, there was one male leader and then two other union officers who were female. Um, in terms of, do we see like the gender dynamics and like the, um, the way in which they mobilize? I actually did not find a big difference. Um, so in the book, I actually go into more detail about um, the small groups and these leisure activities that the workers engage in. I guess the big difference is that the heavy chemical uh, industrial workers, um, their main leisure activity was drinking. And um, they, it was actually this, these drinking activities actually um, also connected to the small group activities, which, you know, had this like leisure component, but as I mentioned in the presentation, during these small group activities, it will lead to study groups and that's how they learn about labor rights and how to organize unions. So these, uh, the structure is similar and I don't really see a big difference, but then the specific activities such as flower arrangement, arranging group that you see more among women, uh, and then like the drinking that you see more among men, but the mechanism is similar. And these are all happening like in the um, rooming houses, in their apartment complexes that are built by the company and inside um, um, in the surrounding areas of the industrial complexes. Great, thank you. Um, the, somebody named Gayar, I think, um, asks whether you feel, look after looking at these decades of industrial complexes, whether the close relationship between the authoritarian leaders and the table made it easier for workers' grievances to turn into political or pro-democracy grievances. Yes, I, I think um, I would agree with that point that um, because of this strong relationship um, between businesses and government, I think that's how we see that the protests did not just remain um, about people's um, disgrievances against their employers, but to understand how did their grievances translate toward the government, I, I would agree that this close relationship that the government has with the businesses um, that, but then, you know, we also need to recognize that the workers had to see that connection. So being able to see that connection and learning about how the employers are exploiting them, but it's ultimately for uh, the government and they're receiving these benefits from the government when they reach these export goals, these were all, um, you know, part of the workers' consciousness developing through these study groups um, and small groups. Thanks. Um, I want to turn now in our final few minutes to some of the legacies uh, for democratic politics in South Korea today. Um, and I guess one sort of specific question that I have for you is uh, other scholars, including Dave Kang, have um, made the argument that economic development also increased the power of the chaebol vis-a-vis the state in a sense and that they came, became uh, more of a check on the state and eventually contributed to demands for political liberalization do you find your argument um, fits with that argument or do you disagree with it if so how um, and then another uh, question from sumesh in terms of legacies is i think um, generationally how do subsequent generations view the activism um, of workers from the 70s and the 80s? Um, and how do subsequent generations of workers look back on that activism today? 
Okay, um, so these are very interesting questions, and I think they are, um, I guess, going beyond um, the, the scope of um, my project, but um, obviously, you know, there are implications and continuity beyond the time period that I focused on. And yes, it is, um, it has been documented by scholars that um, the economic development under dictatorship um, also contributed to the development of Chebars to the point that, you know, they became too big to fail. And um, I think, um, again, this is like kind of like beyond, um, you know, where my book project is at, but um, a lot of scholars have also um, identified the cause of the financial crisis in the 1990s as this like empowered Chebar vis-a-vis the government. And, um, in the democratic period, uh, the presidents always campaign on democratization of the economy. Um, we have achieved political democratization, although that may be, you know, uh, debated by some scholars today, but, you know, democratizing the economy, and that usually is about um, decreasing the power of um, the Chebars. Um, and I think it sort of started to happen um, as, um, well, I guess it's more complicated and it's sort of like beyond um, my specialty, but um, government had strong control over the, um, the Chebars during the authoritarian period, but because of the neoliberal reforms uh, associated with the financial crisis, the government had to loosen its control. Um, so in that way, the Chebars have more independence. So I guess, you know, um, what I can say is that, you know, this problem that Korea as a democracy has right now has roots back to the authoritarian period in which the government had to work closely with these uh, businesses. And, but, you know, again, I think the typical understanding is that, oh, you know, it's the government who made them big and they were just sort of like following. But I think um, Professor Amy Kim um, in her um, works show that there was also more of an agency that the Chebars also had during the authoritarian period. So it's not purely, you know, um, the creation of the government that now governments have to deal with. Um, so I think, again, you know, there's many um, aspects to that. And then to think about how workers today view activism of the past. Um, so I think now labor activism, um, so I think one of the main uh, areas in which um, people have been studying labor activism is looking at um, temporary workers in Korea, which is actually um, something that became a big issue after the financial crisis and the neoliberal reforms. And um, these temporary workers um, are in a more precarious position than these uh, workers who are now unionized as a result of the efforts from the authoritarian period. Um, so it's interesting that the workers who didn't have, you know, like who um, fought for their rights, especially to, to organize, have able to achieve them after um, Korea became a democracy. But after Korea became a democracy, there's this like new uh, group of workers who are, um, not in the same position as the others who have come before them. And I think that's, again, you know, uh, along with the democratization of the economy when um, and talking about uh, lessening the power of the Chebar, another big topic that all um, South Korean politicians, especially if they're running for um, important positions, always talk about is this issue of temporary workers, including um, the current president Moon Jae-in. So I think there are lessons to learn, um, but also same problems that exist. And to add just another layer to this, you know, there's been um, increasing migrant workers in 
Korea and um, these migrant workers do not have the same kinds of protection and rights. And a lot of them are also in this um, temporary workforce and um, how the state would respond to them is different from how they respond to their own citizens. So again, uh, it's interesting how, you know, there are lessons to be learned from the authoritarian period, but new issues and challenges also come about um, that may make things a little bit more complicated and difficult to handle. Great, thank you, um, Joan. I think, unfortunately, we are pretty much out of time today, so I do have to apologize for the remaining questions that we did not get a chance um, to answer directly. But please um, join me remotely in this awkward way on Zoom to thank Professor Joan Cho for her presentation today um, and all of you for joining from around the world. Thank you very much and hope to see you at future GWICS events. Thank you. Thank you.